Okay, so um, hello everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us for this um, capstone reflection and presentation session. Um, I hope you've been enjoying all of the other workshops. Um, my name is Raj. I'm one of the foundation interns for this summer. I am a rising senior at the College of New Jersey and I'll be helping our wonderful seniors present their um, their research and facilitate this workshop. Um, so we have with us Thomas Fedor, who is a graduate uh, from Carson Newman University, and Emily Thomas, who is a graduate from Ursinus College, and they will both be presenting on addressing the prison industrial complex. Um, Emily will present her research, and then Thomas will present his. While they are presenting, feel free to send questions um, and discussion thoughts in the chat box. After they both present, we'll have about 15 minutes at the end for an open Q&A session. Um, for allow, uh, to allow them to expand upon any questions or um, ideas you may all may have. Um, so without further ado, Emily, if you wanna go ahead. Perfect. Hi everyone, I'm Emily. Um, thank you for coming to this session. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with everyone, but it, I think I need approval first. Um, yes, you should be a co-host, so you should be able to. Oh, look at that. Okay, I got it. <laughs> um, one second. Okay. And then. All righty. Can you all see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so like you heard, my name's Emily. I just graduated from our sinus college um, in Collegeville, Pennsylvania. I was a double major in neuroscience and educational studies. Um, and when I first went to school, I actually thought I was going into the medical field. Um, and after you'll hear um, from my research and my experience in Bonner, that has completely changed to criminal law now. Um, so we'll get started with the research here. So basically my research was on zero tolerance policies in the school to prison pipeline within schools and specifically disciplinary practices that schools do. Oh, can you still see me? We can still see your screen. Okay, great. <laughs> um, so basically the idea of my research was to look at um, why we discipline, unintended consequences of punishment, zero tolerance policies, the history of zero tolerance policies, specifically in the United States, the controversy of these suspension and expulsion and racial socioeconomic and disability factors and the school to prison pipeline. So it, is definitely a little intense so we're only going to go through a certain amount of things um, but if you have further questions please put them in the chat so just to start off um, education in the u.s is a promise of equal opportunity and access to the american dream this idea is that education equals the playing field and helps individuals in an upward stride in social mobility and expands possible job horizons Unfortunately, this idea is outdated and is fueled by class and race disparities. Shifts in educational policy have changed in the past 15 years and have made the inequalities in education larger. Rather than creating an atmosphere of learning, engagement, and opportunity, current educational practices have increasingly blurred the distinction between school and jail via zero tolerance policies. So just a few terms. Um, a zero tolerance policy is basically a policy that is giving the most severe punishment to every person who commits a crime or breaks a rule. The school to prison pipeline is defined as growing, is a growing pattern of tracking students out of the educational institutions directly and or indirectly into the juvenile and adult criminal justice system. And who do these policies affect most? Students of color and students with emotional, behavioral, and physical disabilities. So before we get into the history of um, zero tolerance policies, um, I did some research on why we discipline in the first place. 
Um, so basically what my research said is that we discipline because it's part of our human nature and that we have to do it. However, we have to be really careful not to designate many behaviors into one artificial category and believe that we have solved the problem because we have classified it. Um, if we think about it, people react differently in various situations. So a student or a person will act differently in the classroom than they will in church or at a football game or swimming or shopping or driving a car. Um, and so that being said, it is obviously unwise to classify behaviors into these categories that have to do with only a few situations and it pr provides a partial response. So the history of zero tolerance policies, um, basically in 1988, the United States Attorney General Meese ordered customs officials to catch the vehicles and belongings of anyone crossing the border with even a very small amount of drugs and give them federal charges. In 1989, school districts in California, New York, and Kentucky started to use the term zero tolerance policy, and they used this by mandating expulsion for drugs, fighting, and gang-related activities. By 1993, the zero tolerance policies were being used across the country, not only for drugs and weapons, but also school disruptions. And then the Clinton administration in 1994, was they signed the Gun-Free Schools Act, which is now a national policy, and this mandates the students who had a firearm receive a one-year calendar expulsion and a referral to the criminal or juvenile justice system. This started out just covering guns and then moved to anything that could be used as a weapon. So probably as most of you know, the prison growth in the United States has been increasing. Um, so this is just a timeline that shows when the war on drugs started, um, how many people were incarcerated to currently. Um, and this is just to kind of help you map out how these discipline practices have influenced the amount of people that are incarcerated. So there's obviously some controversy that comes with um, zero tolerance policies and the school to prison pipeline. The first one being school safety. Um, a lot of researchers that I've read have argued that it would help prevent more serious violence in the future. Um, but on the other hand, there is an inappropriate use of it. Um, we'll see later, I have a couple um, case studies, um, but it is disproportionately used with students of color and students with disabilities. So my basic fundamental question was, what are the outcomes and effects of zero tolerance policies and how helpful are they? And if they're not helpful, what should we be doing instead? So because I do come from a science background, um, I did some research into how zero tolerance affects the teenage brain. Um, so the teenage brain is a prime time for all types of learning which basically means emotional, behavioral, and academic learning. Um, also, students have a higher density of neurons at age 14, and that lessens as age goes on. So environment is very important in how you respond to stimuli. And emotional behavior, um, if you've been around any teenagers, um, the teenage brain is highly sensitive to emotional behavior. And so these kind of backup um that we should not be grouping all of these behaviors and crimes into one artificial category so for my bonner service i have been teaching ged at montgomery county correctional facility in pennsylvania um, for three and a half years and so when i was doing this research um one of my fellow Bonners was like, well, why don't you include um, your students at MCCF? And I was like, wow, that's great. Um, so basically my class size when I did this, which was a year and a half ago, I had eight male students. 
Um, six of them were black, one was Latino, and one was white. All students were under the age of 30. Um, GED classes, we focused on basically every area of study, but one thing that my students struggled with the most were five paragraph essays, which brought up a question of what we should be teaching in schools. Um, how helpful is it for me to be teaching them how to write a five paragraph essay or how to add and subtract fractions um, was definitely a question that I would love to look into. Um, and then lastly, all of my students were suspended at least three times between the ages of 10 and 17. All of my students did not graduate and seven out of eight of them did not make it to 10th grade. Um, and so this was pretty profound for me, um, especially the fact that all of my students were suspended at least three times before the ages of 10 and 17. Um, and that's just at least a lot of my students were suspended more times for that and it was for behavioral issues or specifically fighting um and one specifically um, brought in a toy gun and was suspended for that so there are definitely a lot of things that can influence why students are suspended um, but using zero tolerance policies you are then kicking these students out of school um, and expecting them to get schooling somewhere else when that's usually not the case. So in a paper that I read, um, it was discussing the role of race and zero tolerance policies. And a lot of people, um, when I talked to them about my research, they would either say that race wasn't a factor or they were expelled because they did something bad and that was their fault. So I wanted to make it clear um, when I'm answering this question, are non-white students more likely to be suspended or expelled than white students? Um, the results of this, not only this study, but many other studies um, showed that non-white students are twice as likely to be suspended than white students. Males do have a significantly higher risk and poverty, can also influence um, the discipline practices. However, race is a consistent factor um, with most of the suspensions. So even though you could make the argument that poor grades and poor school attachment are related to school punishment, um, that's not always the case. However, race is consistent. So like I said in the beginning, um, there has been research done with students with disabilities um, and how a lot of times that their behavior will get them expelled. So um, special education learners are frequently involved in classroom disruptions. Um, sometimes that means violation of the dress code. Um, and then sometimes it's just how they act within the classroom but they are now being handled with the zero tolerance policy as well. So um, school administration and teachers are now viewing behavior as more than an act. And so they are using zero tolerance policies to handle those behaviors. So an example, um, so in December of 2018, a 15-year-old high school who was taking pills prescribed to her by her doctor to relieve migraines and to prevent seizures was expelled for violation of the district's zero tolerance anti-drug policy. She also then received a referral to an alternative school because the medicine was not with the nurse. Um, this example was pretty appalling to me because the medicine was prescribed by her doctor, yet because she had it in her backpack, um, she was expelled. There was pushback with her family and other um, people at the school that she, she was able to come back, but um, it's just an example of how zero tolerance policies can really um, impact students negatively. And then there's a question of what do we do now? Um, so there are a lot of things. 
that I just threw at you and what we can do now is is a really big question and something that I'm always thinking about. Um, but I've kind of split it into four separate um, ideas. So the first one is replace the one size fits all disciplinary strategies. Obviously you've seen that they don't work. Um, and so appropriate discipline practices for less and more serious crimes um, is really important, whether that means parent contact, community service, um, but to just send a kid out of school um, for a less crime uh, is really something that fuels the school to prison pipeline. The second thing is to expand options available for schools dealing with disruptive or violent behavior. Um, I would like to think that administrators do not wanna push their students out, however, their, the perception of crimes is very different between the students and of the teachers and administrators. So school teachers and administrators see discipline practices as a student choice and that the consequence they receive is an appropriate and fair reaction to that choice. So this basically means that if students choose to disrupt, they choose how many classes they attend, and based off of that information, the teachers and administrators are able to punish them in whichever way they deem appropriate. Um, students, on the other hand, especially students who are at risk, view discipline practices as confrontational classroom management or seen, or seen the student misbehave sorry, as classroom management. And then sometimes students are misbehaving because they see things as unfair. And so having teachers and administrators trying to navigate, that would be really helpful. Um, the third thing is preventative measures that can improve school climate and reconnect the students who were expelled. Um, so this could mean conflict resolution, anger management, bully prevention. There are lots of different options for that. And then lastly, uh, one thing that I think is probably the most important thing is constant evaluation. Um, we haven't looked at our zero tolerance policies in quite some time, especially in schools. And so having schools and teachers and administrators and communities look at their practices that they use and ask if it's really helping student behavior and school safety, because usually if there's not much help that's happening and it's hindering more than it's helping. Um, and so that is my last thought. And that's just questions. And thank you so much for listening. And I look forward to our discussion afterwards. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really comprehensive and amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Thomas, if you want to present, and then we will do questions towards the end. So to all of the participants, feel free to send questions in the chat box or be ready to raise your hand towards um, the end. Yes, thank you so much. So again, it's, it's, it's a privilege to be here and to present some of my research. Um, just to, I just want to give kind of like the origin of my project. Um, at Carson Newman, I do speech and debate. And so um, private probation was the topic of my persuasive speech, if you are familiar with that language. And so I was able to kind of parlay that into some senior seminar research, and then of course, into my capstone. So obviously the kind of main discussion overall with regards to this entire session is simply the prison industrial complex. Now there are many issues within the prison industrial complex and the way that I like to think about it is a lattice kind of framework. So there are various issues, private prisons, although we won't discuss that in this session, you likely know about its existence. And then as Emily so eloquently discussed the school to prison pipeline, and I'm going to be discussing the uh, private probation. However, it's important to point out that there are many other intersecting issues with all of these other issues. And so in addition to discussing private probation, I'm going to discuss plea bargains. I'm going to discuss the probation to prison pipeline. And I'm also going to discuss a kind of the importance of revenue collection to many of these local governments as well. So in, in order for us to really understand probation, generally speaking, and private probation specifically, we have to look at about probation and its relationship to incarceration within the United States. 
as most of you know, we have a huge incarceration problem in the United States. We have the highest incarceration rate of really any NATO country with, as Emily pointed out, around 2.3 million individuals incarcerated. However, if we look at the, the individuals currently on community supervision or probation or parole, we have almost twice that amount of people being supervised by probation officers. In fact, one in 55 adults or nearly 2% of the adult population in the US were on some form of community supervision. Now, of course, this varies state by state with one in 18 in Georgia and one in 168 in New Hampshire. The disproportionate impacts of this system also disproportionately impact African-Americans with 30% of those on probation or parole being African-American. And finally, three fourths of those on community supervision were convicted of nonviolent drug offenses. Now with regards to that last statistic, that isn't necessarily a bad thing because the, pro because the purpose of probation was allow individuals who were found guilty of a crime to remain within their communities while they supervised by probation officer. Now, as we'll discuss, it does not really live up to its purpose, but that purpose is important to keep in mind. Now, individuals who are on probation are usually faced with around 10 to 20 requirements, such as paying their fines and fees, avoiding contact with known felons, reporting regularly to their supervising officer, participating in programming, and abiding by their curfew and movement restrictions. Now, the main difference between probation and parole is simply when an individual gets on either one of those two kinds of community supervision. Oftentimes, probation is handed down at the time of sentencing, whereas if you go on to parole, usually you've spent some of your sentence in prison or jail and are thus being let out early and then being put on parole. But the, but the requirements themselves are oftentimes very, very similar. Now, why am I talking so much about probation, generally speaking? Because what we can see through this map is that there are a significant number of states that do, in fact, use private probation. However, most states do not use private probation. And so I wanted to, this presentation to be very informative because there are problems with probation, generally speaking, that likely apply to your state. And if you live in a state with private probation, we can see how private probation really makes many of the problems endemic to probation far, far worse. Now, why is private probation adopted by many states? Research has found that state budgets have not been able to keep pace with the burgeoning uh, probation populations and clients currently on community supervision. And what this has led many states to do is simply pass the baton off to local governments. But local governments have the same issue with regards to funding probation services. Thus, they are put into a kind of trichotomy where either they can force individuals to stay in jail longer, let individuals go without punishment, or provide some kind of way in which individuals can be integrated or stay in the community. In, in this case, provide probation services. Now, it's important to point out that all that these aren't inherently bad outside of probation services. For example, we know about the problem with regards to the uh, war on drugs. I'm sure many of us support the decriminalization of marijuana. That would fall under let individuals go without punishment, but that wouldn't be a bad thing. However, probation does serve an important purpose with regards to keeping individuals in the community, even though they are guilty of some form of crime. Local governments realizing this have looked to private probation companies in order to fill the need of uh, probation services. And specifically, there are really two benefits of using a private probation company. The first is financial. Private probation is often called offender funded probation because the probationer themselves are the ones that fund these private probation companies. It's not these local governments. Now, the second benefit to private probation is that local governments are insulated from legal liability. So if a private probation company violates a probationer's uh, civil rights, the, that specific company will be responsible for that violation, not the local government. So thus we see really two incentives for these local governments to adopt private probation, legal and financial insulation. Now, what do conditions of a pro private probationer look like? Largely, they are very similar to just public probationers. 
Um, with the small difference being that oftentimes private probationers are usually simply convicted of misdemeanor crimes because many states who use private probation have separate re regimes for individuals uh, who have committed felonies. But oftentimes they, they are subject to the same 10 to, to 20 re requirements, paying fines and fees, avoiding contact with known felons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The big difference comes with regards to how much they have to pay into the system itself. Every private probation company requires the payment of monthly supervision fees, and this is around $50 every month. But in addition to that, if a private probation company requires a probationer to have a drug test, that individual is going to pay for it. If they require treatment classes, oftentimes put on by that private probation company, that individual has to, pay, has to pay for it. If they require electronic monitoring, that person has to pay for it. And so it's a pretty significant difference in that every single aspect of their probation, they are actually having to pay for it. And with that comes significant problems. But before we get to that, we have to understand where the probation to prison pipeline oftentimes begins. And that's with plea deals. Now, plea deals allow individuals to plead guilty to a charge in order to get a lesser sentence. In 1970, the Supreme Court found that this process was in fact constitutional because it was simply a practical necessity or else the criminal justice system would be overrun. However, over the past 50 years, trial by jury, which is a Sixth Amendment right, is basically extinct in the United States as it happens in less than 3% of cases. Now this becomes especially problematic when we realize that prosecutors often overcharge individuals to force them into accepting plea deals even when they aren't guilty for those specific charges. And often these plea deals are signed without legal counsel present. So what this might look like is that let's say that I commit a robbery on the street and so I would be charged with robbery. But in addition to that, a prosecutor might charge me with, for example, street terrorism. Now, I might not be guilty of street terrorism, but in order for me to avoid getting that sentence, I would have to either accept the plea deal or go to trial by jury. Now, there is a huge disincentive for individuals to go to a trial by jury. We know how oftentimes these are stacked against people who are at these low, high risk, low income individuals, especially when they are pe uh, people of color. So what oftentimes individuals are having to choose between a potential 10 years in prison or a sure two years. And oftentimes people choose the sure two years over the potential 10 years. Now it's also important to point out that this is oftentimes where individuals get put on probation. One common example is a DUI. If you commit a DUI, you're likely to be offered a stay on probation and if you complete that probation, then you might have that expunged from your criminal record. But there are problems with that probation, specifically the 10 to 20 conditions that you are required to fulfill. Now, many of these often seem pretty reasonable on paper. So for example, abstaining from drug and alcohol use. However, when you are a part of an at-risk, low-income population, oftentimes these other requirements requirements become much harder to in fact fulfill. For example, avoiding contact with known felons. As someone in one of these communities, you likely know someone who is a felon. You might have family members who are felons and you might even be living with an individual who is a felon. What about if you're a low income? It might be hard to pay the fines and fees required by your stint on probation. And in participating in programming, that might keep you from finding or maintaining employment. And that's not even mentioning the fact that oftentimes individuals are put on, on probation after a stint in jail, whether that's one day, two days, or even a week, which oftentimes results in them losing their employment. Thus, when they get on probation, many people start at square one. And again, it's not even talking about the extra fees and fines associated with private probation companies. Now, violating one of these conditions is enough to get your probation revoked and for you to be sent to jail. Now, oftentimes it requires much more than one violation, but it can be hard for many of these at-risk, low-income individuals to refrain from breaking these conditions. Now, you might be asking yourself, it seems kind of unreasonable to jail someone for not being able to pay fines and fees. 
and the Supreme Court would actually agree with you. In Bearden v. Georgia, the Supreme Court ruled that individuals cannot be jailed because of, the, because of their inability to pay their fines and fees. Now, this is especially pertinent to those on, pro, on probation because 66% of those on probation earn less than $20,000 per year. But although jailing individuals for their inability to pay is unconstitutional on paper in practice, it does in fact happen. In fact, in a 2014 study, NPR found that in a significant number of cases, jail time wasn't punishment for the crime itself, but for the failure to pay the increasing fines and fees associated with the criminal justice system. In addition to that, oftentimes judges have made exceptions to this general rule by labeling plea deals as contracts that are voluntarily signed. Now, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out why these cannot reasonably be considered voluntarily signed contracts. There is a clear power dynamic at play with really, with these probationers having really no ability to negotiate these plea bargains whatsoever. Thus, the idea that simply sending people to jail because of their inability is simply enforcing a voluntarily signed contract is, in my mind, ludicrous. Now, this becomes even exacerbated by the power of private probation companies. Studies have found with regards to the Human Rights Watch that even when probationers were unable to pay for legal counsel, judges were reluctant to waive their probation fees because they were concerned about how it would impact private probation companies. Thus, judges are putting the interests of private probation companies over the interests of people making their way through the criminal justice system. But even when a court tries to make a determination of an individual's ability to pay, oftentimes they'll delegate this, this decision to probation officers. Now, to some extent, this makes sense because probation officers are going to be spending much more time with these individuals. They're going to know more about them than a judge likely could or ever would be able to know about them. However, this becomes particularly pernicious when private probation officers are in charge of making this determination. Oftentimes, their pay is dependent on whether or not they get fees from their specific probationers. Thus, they really have no incentive to label individuals who they are supervising as unable to pay for their fees. And this has had a significant impact on our prison populations. In fact, 45% of state prison admissions nationwide are due to violations of probation or parole for new offenses or technical violations. Now, new offenses include things such as simply committing a new crime, whereas technical violations include violating those 10 to 20 conditions that you are subject to as a probationer or as a parolee. Now, obviously, to me, this illustrates a larger systemic problem with probation. Probation was meant to help people avoid incarceration, but is leading people to incarceration. Now, with regards to technical violations exclusively, one in 10 prison admissions were due to technical violations of the conditions of probation, with one in four prison admissions uh, due to technical violations of the conditions of probation or parole. So these technical violations are a significant contributor to our prison populations. Now, if we look at a state-by-state -state analysis, we can see very differing outcomes and realities. In fact, 20 states, more than half of prison admissions are due to some form of supervision violations. If you look at the graph below, what you'll see is the percentage indicates what percent of the prison population is, is due to some kind of supervision violation. So for example, in Tennessee, it's 39, in New Jersey, it's 27, in New York, it's 41, and in North Carolina, it's 62. Now the different colors illustrates whether or not they were due to technical or non-technical violations. Technical being violations of those 10 to 20 conditions, non-technical likely being some kind of new um, law being broken by these individuals. In Tennessee, my home state, 39% of our prison population or prison admissions were due to technical violations of probation or parole. New 
Jersey, it was a little bit less than 27% of similar proportion in New York. Whereas in North Carolina, we see that almost all of their prison admissions were due to non-technical violations of the supervision violations. And so what this illustrates in my mind is that there are unique problems facing state, facing each state with regards to how reasonable and how problematic each relative or respective system is. Now, in addition to this, many of these issues are far more exacerbated by the reality that these companies, these private probation companies, are incentivized through a profit incentive. Now, this becomes very, very pernicious and has led to many lawsuits. So if we look at Sentinel Offender Services, they incentivized their probation officers through a March Madness program, which offered a chance to win a $1,000 bonus if their probation officer met the program's slam dunk requirements. Now, what these slam dunk requirements often required is that these probation, uh, probation officers extract supervision fees from their probationers. And thus, they were incentivized financially in order to intimidate many of these probationers. And this, this is documented and this is happening with many private probation systems. In fact, in Tennessee, there, were two, there have been two recent kind of high profile lawsuits against private probation companies, one in Rutherford County and one in Giles County, Giles County, depending on who you ask. But the lawsuit alleged that Ms. McNeil, a plaintiff in the case, a, probation, uh, a probationer, often chose to pay the company rather than purchase the medication she needs to treat chronic pain, pay her electricity bill, or pay rent. Ms. McNeil's electricity was shut off because she made payments to CPS, the private probation company, instead of paying her utility bill. She became homeless in significant part because she paid the company instead of her rent. By 2016, Ms. McNeil slept in a tent by a creek. When she told her probation officer of her situation, her probation officer told her, we still have to have payment. In short, probation is deeply, deeply flawed and is very much counterproductive to its own purpose, oftentimes leading individuals to become incarcerated. Many of these problems are far more exacerbated by the existence of private probation companies, which are incentivized to exploit their probationers instead of allowing them to rehabilitate and reincorporate into their own communities. With that, I know that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time. I'm very excited to kind of discuss this information, but uh, that's all I have. Thank you so much again. Sorry. Um, thank you so much, Thomas, and to you as well, to Emily. You guys had some really great um, comprehensive and thorough research. Um, so if you have a question, you can either use the raise your hand function by going to participants, raise hand, or you can type it in the chat box and I'll read them out loud. Um, somebody asked, is there a way we can have access to these presentations after the call has ended? Yes. So on Bonner Learning Community, uh, both of the presentations are posted in there and a recording of this Zoom call will also be posted in there as well. Uh, Karen uh, raised her hand. So if you have a question, you can go ahead. Yes. Hi. Uh, I am Karen Barron. I'm from Washburn University. I'm faculty in the English department and also um, coordinator of community engaged learning. And I was just wondering a, a couple of things. One is maybe related to your uh, the previous person that asked the question. And uh, I know that you said that the these will be recorded. And so we participants here at the the conference have access but i was wondering about permission to share these um you know your capstone presentations here with other students uh, at my university like um uh that that might have an interest in it um and i'm sp thinking specifically of crim criminal justice students uh, who might be interested in, in the work that you've done 
as well as uh, instructors from um, criminal justice, because I think it, it would be of interest, but I didn't, I wanted to be sure and ask about that. I wasn't sure if that was uh, something that you would give permission for. So that is, that's one question that I have. And my second question is, I, I, I got interrupted when, um, in the first presentation where, uh, I can't think of her name right now, I'm just blanking, but um, where she was talking about actually doing a GED program in the prison and that I think her students got involved in that. And I, and I just wondered how her students participated in that. I, I didn't get to hear that and I'm not sure if she talked about it or not. So those are my questions. Yeah, so I can answer um, your question about the GED program that I was part of. Um, so are you asking about the students that were in my class um, or students that I brought to do service with me? I'm asking about the students that you brought to do service with you. And I guess I should say that I was involved in a you know, voluntary creative writing program with a local correctional facility in, in our city. And so I was just interested in how your students, your class students were involved with the um, students at the correctional facility. Yeah, great question. Um, so basically how we kind of ran our class is I was the head teacher um, so I would prepare a lesson um, and teach the entire class. And then the other students from Ursinus College that came with me um, helped as individual one-on-one -on -one tutors. Um, a lot of my students uh, have different ranges of when they stop school, um, how long ago they stopped school. So having me just spit information out them is not necessarily helpful. Um, when I can help navigate the Ursinus students with um, a student in the classroom that they are able to help. Um, I do also have English as a second language learners. So if I have a student from Ursinus that's coming who's fluent in Spanish or Russian or something like that, then I'll connect that those students with the students in the class. Okay, that is really helpful, and that is uh, what I wanted to know. So, so what was so your class was GED? So you did do math and English and different different subjects, or did you just focus on English, like the the five paragraph essay? Um, we did all subjects. So all subjects that they have to take in their tests, which is writing, math, reading comprehension, science, and social studies. <laughs> Okay, and so do you mind my asking, so what, what is your um, expertise in? I mean, is it education? Or? Yeah, so I um, am a double major in neuroscience and education. So it's more in um, sciences and math, but I do have people who come with me that are English majors or something in the arts that are able to help me um, give the best presentation that I can, whether it's reading comprehension or grammar is another one. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for, for your response. Thank you. And then, and I think, oh, oh, she also asked like if you both would feel comfortable. Yes. No, I, no I'm fine with that. Um, part of my capstone was uh, for my school was to make a website with some of this stuff on it. And it's not, you can't find it through Google, but I'll, I'll post the link to the website in case you're interested. There's more like written format on there. So uh, maybe you can use that as a resource as well to, to, to send to them. I just put it in the, um, in the chat. I okay. also have Thank a you paper so that I can put as well. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so we have another question from Robert for Thomas. Are private probation companies subject to any governmental oversight? Is there a uniform set of rules on how they should conduct their business? 
um, what qualifications do the private probation officers have? Right, so I don't know about what qualifications the private probation officers have, but as you might have kind of thought, each state is different. Uh, in Tennessee, we have a private probation services council that whose, whose supposed purpose is to oversee these private probation companies. Uh, there was a recent uh, report in the, by the 2018 Comptroller of the Treasury that found that basically their oversight was essentially non-existent. Um, th this council is made up of, of like local leaders. Some of them are like private probation uh, officers themselves, public probation officers, county commissioners, uh, different things along those lines. I think that they just got a new um, kind of leader. And so I think he's trying to do some reform there. I don't know whether that's been successful, especially with COVID-19. Um, with regards to uh, the other question, is that one of the biggest issues with private probation companies is that they are not subject to a lot of the same FOIA uh, kind of uh, transparency that many other um, public entities are subject to. Uh, Kentucky in 2017 tried to implement some, some stricter kind of transparency regulations, but they found, or the ACLU found that they were still essentially flouting many of these rules uh, outright and pretty openly. So there is, not a set uniform set of rules. They differ by state and there is a huge, huge, huge oversight issue as uh, your kind of question alludes to. Awesome, thank you. So uh, Sydney asks the question to the both of you. I know both of you mentioned this a little bit in your presentation, but were there any key, key experiences in your Bonner service or your classes that inspired you to research and conduct these projects? Um, I can start. Um, so my Bonner experiences were the starting point of all of my research. Um, I have done other research within my curriculum. So I looked at antisocial personality disorder um, in terms of the criminal justice system. And then I looked at health care that um, people who are incarcerated receive while they're incarcerated versus when they are released. Um, so yes, it actually started, um, so I started volunteering at MCCF for the pure fact that I needed hours. Um, and somebody was like, hey, Emily, could you come help? And I was like, sure. Um, so kind of my advice would be um, to other Bonners is to take chances with the, your service sites and do things that you never thought that you would do. Um, like I said in the beginning, I thought I was going into the medical field 110%. Um, and then I started volunteering at MCCF and I have completely changed what I'm going to do. Um, so just be able, or just like push yourself to try a different service site. Um, it really could, I mean, turn into this, you're doing your capstone research on it. It's something that you wanna do, but yeah, definitely Bonner has been really impactful um, with all of my research. Yeah, absolutely. I'm very much the same way. As I kind of talked about, my research kind of tipped off of my experience with speech and debate because one of my, you know, speech topics was the topic that I ended up doing my capstone on and my senior seminar class kind of allowed me to kind of tease out um, those ideas and, and, and do some more thorough research on the specific issue. But with regards to Bonner specifically, I think one of the biggest impacts that Bonner has had on my thinking in general um, which, which to me is very, very significant, is to look at issues in a much more systemic way, uh, in the sense of that it's not just one bad actor or, you know, the bad apple that we've, you know, heard so much about. It's like there are real systemic issues that have causes um, that, that, again, are systemic. And so that is one of the, the, the key insights that I've gained through my experience with Bonner. Awesome, thank you. Um, so we have still have a little bit more time for one or two more questions if anybody wants to raise their hand or put it in the chat box. Um, Jeffrey asks for Thomas, I am not sure if you mentioned this already, but did you find any disparity between the rates of incarceration from the private um, and probation with more government insight? Uh, this is a very good question. Um, but the issue is, is that, um, 
and I'll return to my previous answer, which is that there is so little transparency when it comes to private probation companies that it that it's hard for many even nonprofits to kind of do this kind of research. I know a Human Rights Watch, they've come out with two reports on private probation, I think one in 2014, one in 2018, and in even trying to estimate how many individuals are on private probation in Tennessee, they basically had to guesstimate just because this information is just not available to the public. Uh, they had to use various kinds of like numbers and then assume that this kind of amount was, was because of this, this many probationers. So very good question. Um, but the issue is it, just because of the lack of transparency, there's really no way for, for us to really do that research. Um, hello, can I add on to that? Um, just, um, I was wondering, even with that, do you think, um, like what kind of adjustment or, um, things can these kind of probation agency be made? Like, do you think there will be a difference if some kind of change or what, what will be needed to be done to have a more, much more impact on right. increasing yeah. the yeah. Right, so uh, again, there are broad problems with probation generally and then private probation specifically. So for me, I am in support of really getting rid of private probation overall, just because when we think about how these companies are funded, it's through the people who they affect. Thus, if we just increase taxes, what that's going to do to, to, to kind of fund these services would be to allow for that burden to be um, felt by a general population rather than the people who are at risk, putting them further into poverty and increasing their, their um, likelihood of being incarcerated. So that's, that's, that's kind of my take on that. But that doesn't, like you point out, get rid of the problems endemic to private probation, or I mean to probation, generally speaking. And there are some key, um, there, there are some different strategies that, that different states have used to kind of address that. Pew Trust came out with a report a few years ago, I think in, in 2018, um, looking at how these different policies affected states differently and how it impacted their, incarcer their incarceration rates. And so I would point you to that specifically. Um, there's too much to really get into in any kind of meaningful way with regards to what policies worked, what didn't work. But what I will say is that there are real steps that can be taken to reduce um, the, the, the probation to prison pipeline that currently exists. Great, thank you both so much for presenting and talking about your research. It was a really great discussion. Um, I'm sure we all learned a lot. Um, one more question, Thomas, can you share the name of the report you mentioned? Yes, let me, I can pull up very, very quickly. It's, it's right here, but feel free to, I can just message him directly. So okay. don't, don't let that <laughs> interfere with your kind of sign off. I was just saying thank you all so much for coming to the session and for both Thomas and Emily for presenting their research. Um, both of these will be, the recording of the session will be posted on the Bonner Learning Community as well as their presentations where you all can download them and look at the different um, resources. There's a link to Thomas's um, website on there as well. Um, and their emails are in the chat for anybody who wants to reach out to them. But thank you all so much for joining us today.